Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Time is now 105, and uh, the quorum of the board is present. The State Board of Education meeting of April 10th, 2012, is called to order. And the uh, first item this afternoon is approval of the State Board of Ed minutes. And the first one is approval of the first one's the regular committee whole meeting on March 13th. Moved by John. Support. Supported by Nancy. All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, same. And approval of minutes of the closed session of March 13th, 2012. Moved by John. Support. Supported by Cassandra. Discussion? All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, same. And Dan, you are on the phone, right? I am on the phone. Thank you, sir. And we can move right to public participation. We have some guests, and I think we've got some blue paper here. So, mm -hmm. cool. We can get right into that. Mertz? We, I have three forms. Um, if there are any more, um, if you could get those, pass those up to me, that would be great. I will remind you that um, each participant is given five minutes, and the board does not um, have a discourse back and forth um, at this time. But you are welcome to present um, any written information or verbal comments to the board. And the first speaker is Sean Boltzma. Sean, while you're coming up, did you guys notice that it is snowing out right now? Yeah. I don't know if you. Yeah. <laughs> it's Monster. And for the record, I had nothing to do with the snow that's coming out. <laughs> Thanks again for the opportunity to address you uh, this afternoon. Maybe I can switch out here. There we go. Um, I want to uh, spend some time with you just uh, talking a little bit about the preparation standards of school counselors that have been presented. Um, we've been working on that uh, some time with the staff in the Michigan Department of Ed. I very much appreciate their work. I very much appreciate their intent to reach out and uh, identify best practices in the field of school counseling to help inform um, those standards. And so uh, moving forward, I did hear some concerns that the standards were too vague. And I would like to provide a reminder um, of the proficiency level ratings that are provided in those standards. There's an A, B, and C that indicates the degree that school counselors need to be familiar and demonstrate that the training preparation programs demonstrate those various competencies. Um, so for example, an education development plan, which is not uh, addressed in the standards because it may change, the specifics of an education development plan may change. But the content and the expectation that students are prepared for um, career planning does not change. That's a standard that remains. And so most school counselor preparation programs I would anticipate would take advantage of the resources provided by the Michigan Department of Education through all the tremendous resources on education development plans. And if you take a very close look at that, all of these elements that we're discussing are included in college and uh, career preparation. So I think it starts to become a bit redundant, um, especially when it comes to um, providing a specific course in the preparation where in the school counselor preparation programs across our nation, no one prescribes courses uh, that need to be included, but rather the content, and it's left for the programs then to determine how they meet that, those content standards. Um, that's true of our accrediting bodies. For example, multicultural competence. A program can choose to have a course specific to multicultural competence, or demonstrate that they're meeting those standards across the curriculum and addressing multicultural competence across the courses. And so I submit that for consideration. Um, we certainly think it's a great idea to include um, on uh, test development through that process. I think that's a wonderful way to make sure that these standards are included and that process is well underway. There's one more issue that I'd like to address in the short time that I have with you, and that's the relationship to MCAN, which comes up, which as school counselors, we fully endorse and would like to continue those relationships. What we take issue with, and you look at it particularly with the memos of understanding that are sent to the schools, is that there's no opportunity to describe what the relationship with school counselors will look like. And as I spoke earlier, the importance of a program 
and no longer focused on the, the, the person of a school counselor, but the focus in schools by the Michigan Department of Education standards, their recommended practices with the developmental guidance program posted on the website as endorsed, that we should work together with MCAN to define what that relationship and how those Michigan College Access Network prayer professionals don't replace school counselors, but work with them. And that's the part to date that has been missing that I would really encourage you to um, continue that conversation between school counselors and, and MCAN. I think there's a really great opportunity that we're missing. And by the way, there are some that are happening um, sort of uh, relationships with school counselors and the, the MCAN paraprofessionals who are coming in um, that are sort of happening um, not it, it's not a structured per se, we're defining how it happens, it's just emerging, which I, I love to see, and that's encouraging to see how those positions are being embraced. What I fear is that many school counselors are afraid that these MCAN folks, sort of like the social workers we talked about earlier, are taking on the role of a school counselor. And it's very clear in our conversations earlier that the intent is not for MCAN to replace school counselors. Um, I, it's very clear in the administrative rules what the role of a school counselor is. The Professional Association for the American School Counselor Association um, articulates the relationship of paraprofessionals to a school counseling program. And I really want to encourage you to pay attention to those best practices that the professional associations are saying our students can get where they need to be when school counselors are given the opportunity to do the work that they're trained to do. To have uh, many principals will say, yep, I've got my school counselor doing their job. They're doing test administration or coordination. None of us are trained in that, nor is it a standard. But yet that's something that we're relegated to do um, and that is put on our plate. So I really encourage you to trust that the standards as we put them in place take those um, professional, um, professional standards into consideration as we move forward. And I really look forward to um, continuing to develop that role with the Michigan College Access Network personnel. It's an exciting time for students in Michigan. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. The second speaker is Patrick O'Connor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank, you. <clears throat> Thank you again for the opportunity to, wow, this is starting to look like a press conference. Which, which, one, <laughs> which one of these should I work with? This one? one? This one? Okay, thanks. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, whatever one my headmaster is watching because I want to make sure that I'm here today. So. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to, to speak with you about this issue. Um, I, I would take just a minute uh, in, in the interest of full dis disclosure to indicate that I am a member of the Board of Directors of the Michigan College Access Network. and. I can assure you that Brandy Johnson would be happy to address any issues that you may have concerns about in terms of the, uh, the National College Advising Corps members supplanting counselors uh, as, as a condition of a contract when MCAN agrees to place a, uh, a, count, a core member into a school. The school agrees that they will not uh, fire, replace, that this is not replacing a counselor. So um, MCAN is well aware of that issue. and will continue to work to make sure that's clear as the program expands. So um, I, I, I simply would, would, would say that, you know, my interest in this is um, in, in making sure that quality post-secondary advice, particularly college advice, is important for a host of reasons. Uh, first of all, there was a statistic that was released from Ed Trust two weeks ago that said that 40% of all students of color in the United States who are receiving a Pell Grant uh, suspended at a for-profit institution. And we want to be careful about that because there are some very noble for-profit institutions that are doing excellent work with students. But at the same time, Ed Trust has, has concluded that does speak to students getting caught up in the go, go to school after, after high school to get a good job uh, rhetoric that sometimes does not clearly articulate those choices. So when we're talking about, about good college and post-secondary advising, we're also talking about a piece that includes advising students when not to go to college, uh, because that is not the answer for everyone. So we're really talking about a pretty broad range of things here. Um, in, in my research on the importance of having a college counseling class, I came across two statistics that I'd share with you today. Um, the American School Counseling Association lists about 450 uh, 
programs that prepare school counselors in the United States. And of those, according to the National Association for College Admission Counseling, about 40 offer a separate course in college advising. Uh, the fact that, the, that there is discretion about what to put in this course or whether it should be distributed over several courses um, is, is certainly an important one, but at the same time, the, the information from College Board, the information from Public Agenda would suggest that whatever is currently being attempted nationally just simply isn't working. The counselors feel that way, the, uh, the parents feel that way, and the students feel that way. So clearly we need to start looking at some other avenues. Um, part of that interest is what drove me to actually create a course that I now teach in post-secondary in college counseling. It's currently being offered through Oakland Community College and through Schoolcraft College as SBCEUs. And um, I have a copy of that syllabus for you to take a look at so that as the discussion continues about what specifically we should be looking for, this curriculum was primarily designed by the members of the association, and we've test-driven it for three or four years, and I would provide that for your consideration as we continue the discussion about should the standards be changed or what exactly we're looking for in terms of measuring success as it comes to school counseling. Uh, I've had school counselors who have taken this course who have been school counselors for 20 years. I've had folks who have never actually been school counselors who are being hired by private schools. And the response has pretty much been the same. Um, the course is, is comprehensive, um, and a lot of times I have people who have been in this business longer than me, the, the two of them that have been in this business longer than me, and, uh, and, I, and they say, you know, I, I never knew that. And, and all I can think about is, you know, everybody means well, but at the end of the day, that means that those counselors have been giving inadequate information to hundreds of students over tens of years. Um, and I think that's, that's really what we're all trying to focus on in terms of improvement. So I'll, I'll pass these around uh, for your consideration, and I'll be happy to send electronic copies as well. Thank you again for the chance to speak with you today. There are actually Thank you. Our next speaker is Lori Johnston. Good afternoon. I'm not sure which one, which one's working. <laughs> um, I want to bring two perspectives to you. Uh, I currently am a counselor in a suburban district in Grand Rapids. I've been a counselor for about 24 years, and I work in a, in a good suburban district, a great suburban district. Um, my caseload is maybe 370-ish, around there. But that just began in August, and prior to that I spent 10 years in Hastings, which is a rural, very rural district, um, about 40 miles away from here. And in the 10 years that I spent there, um, four different times in that 10-year period, counselors were eliminated from um, the staffing. And we started with eight, and there are currently two people still employed that are counselors, but their role significantly changed. Um, it went from being someone who dealt with all the aspects of counseling that are dealt with in the standards to uh, more of a paper pusher, more of a um, you know, registrar type person, enrolling new kids, sending transcripts, doing schedules, doing testing like Sean referred to, um, all the things that are not related to uh, directly talking to students. And so what I want, uh, the point I guess I want to make is twofold. One, we do have an issue in the state uh, in terms of our funding, you know, something you guys have been dealing with for a long time. And, and I guess I would urge you, if you have an opportunity, to consider counseling to not be a non-essential service as we move forward um, in the looking at some of the aspects of what the job entails through those standards, you know, whether it's college and career preparation, whether it's social emotional, whether it's academic support, those are all really important things. But when in many of our cases they have been relegated to, to be known as non-essential services, you are removing from the very people who need the services the most the opportunity to interact with them. 
and that is a huge, huge challenge. I know there are districts. I, I still live in Hastings, so I commute into the Grand Rapids area. My children go to school in Hastings. They don't have a counselor. Um, fortunately, their mom is one, and you know we'll we'll take care of things um, in that respect as well, you know, as much as I can. But my own children go to a school where there aren't counselors, and um, that is a, c a huge concern. And there are other districts surrounding us where that that has happened as well. In addition to the whole that whole issue, I'd like to just um, share a little bit about my own preparation for becoming a counselor. I shared w this with a few of you um, in between the break session. And <clears throat> I began uh, in the field of education for the intent purpose of becoming a counselor. I wasn't the teacher who they decided, oh, we have to find a job for you. Or I wasn't the teacher who didn't like to teach anymore. I went into education to be a counselor because I wanted to work with students to make sure they had opportunities and to support them in, in their growth and um, have spent the last 24 years doing that. My preparation for that, while it was tremendous, and I learned a lot about um, some of the psychological aspects that some of you asked, there was absolutely nothing about 80 to 90 percent of the job that I do every day. And that has to do with all of the college, the career, the testing, the, the other parts of the job other than interacting with a student about a social or emotional or academic problem. And so, while it can be interspersed, and, and I've been a person who has gone and presented to college um, preparation courses and um, you know, offered an hour here, an hour there of support and have mentored new counselors, um, that doesn't take away the, or it, you don't get the same takeaway from that as you would if you had a full entire course that was devoted strictly to college admission counseling. And if in the state we want to continue to move towards that, it, it feels like we really need to make that more of a uh, important uh, item than just relegating it to being interspersed throughout other courses. I have a colleague in my own department who's been a counselor for many years. She's a great counselor. She was moved from the middle school to the high school and had to start over in terms of what do I know about college admission counseling? Where do I get that information? What, what do I do? And we spent significant money and training and we'll continue to do that to support her. But if it had been part of our preparation, we wouldn't be in that situation. So I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today to speak to you about this and um, look forward to answering any questions uh, or providing any information as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Andrea Moss, and I believe that's the last speaker unless someone else has a form. I came with a little bit of homework for you, and I'm not sure who I would can, want to. Can you speak into the microphone? I'm please? sorry, I came with a little bit of homework for people, so I see there's more than I have. There's more um, people here than I have prepared for, so. For those of us that don't want homework. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, I uh, will tell you about myself. I'm a parent. I'm a parent of a high school student in Wild Lake Western High School. I'm also a retired school social worker from Livingston County. Um, I thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak today. I'm seeing an ex a rather disturbing trend in our curriculum that I'd like to make you aware of. I'd like to start out by saying that I'm here today more by accident than by design. What I mean is that I fell into this concern by being a helicopter mom with my youngest daughter and 11th grader at Waldeck Western High School. It was the summer, 2011, last summer, and Julie had a ton of summer reading homework to complete. So I helped her with her advanced placement, world history. I love history, and I've been a, a student of history for quite some time. My intent was to read the assigned chapters in Traditions and Encounters, and I've got the book at, the, at my seat. I'm sorry, I left it there, uh, and to summarize it, and then to help her complete her homework. So don't tell her teacher I did that. I began reading about early civilizations, and the section was the Mesopotamian Society, Hebrew, Israelites, and Jews. On page 46, 
it states that Israelites formed a branch of Hebrews who settled in Palestine, modern-day Israel, after 1200 BCE. And according to the Hebrew scriptures, some Hebrews migrated to Egypt during the 18th century BCE, about 1300 BCE. However, this branch of Hebrews departed under the leadership of Moses and went to Palestine. They interacted and sometimes intermarried with other peoples of the regions, and they even honored some of the deities of the Pal Palestinian peoples. I scratched my head a little bit. I thought that was a little bit strange being a student of... And if you open up your packets, there is um, the very back. If you turn over, as this, um, this lovely lady here in that, in that orange. If you turn it over, you will see the, the Hebrew. Turn it over there, and you will see that the name of the region is Canaan, Canaan. And so what has happened is that this book has, I would say, made a big mistake. And is it, you know, was it, these are PhDs, and you know, how did that happen? I thought it was curious, and so Numbers 34, cha Numbers um, chapter 34 tells you it's Canaan. And I communicated with a U of M professor, Brian Schmidt, of uh, U of M, University of Michigan, who said that it's a rather oddity that it, this book is saying that. But I found that there are other people noticing this problem as well. In fact, I have an investigative re report, which you have in your packet, of American textbooks from uh, grades 6 to 12, published between 1999 and 2011. And the report cites these books to be replete with egregious errors. Textbook errors range from false historical statements to significant omissions and subtle half-truths. Some are blatant and obvious. Others are subtle and deceptive. The errors in these textbooks are not grammatical or typographical. They are substantive, significant, and often repetitive. And this is especially important given the findings of the federal government's National so Assessment of Educational Progress. Uh, Twelfth grade students perform the worst in the subject area of history, poorer than in science, math, and even economics. Therefore, anything that can be done to improve student performance in history, such as eliminating errors in historical revisionism, should be welcomed by anyone who is genuinely concerned about student understanding and performance. A second error, well, that's one thing. So I think we really need to, I, what you have in your packet is the executive summary that describes these errors. And I really feel like I'd like to bring this to your attention. I think it's a very serious issue. I think our children are getting the wrong information. But the International Baccalaureate Program has been another way of a backdoor entering and giving misinformation. So on the other side, on the left-hand side of your packet, you will see a lesson plan, and it is on, on the internet, on the internet, um, and it is through the International Baccalaureate Global Engage, and it gives a very, in my opinion, one-sided view of the Arab-Israeli conflict. It cites one single source on a very controversial issue guiding students to go down one particular path. This is now becoming mainstream in our public education. My question is, is this education or is this indoctrination? And we're allowing public school teachers to take this on. I think it's a great liability that we're putting our teachers in. So please, I hope you familiarize this yourselves with this packet. Thank you. <coughs> public participation and um, John president's report well, I, I'm going to make almost no report in favor of trying to get soon to the legislative discussion and but let me just say one thing about why um, I think that's important and Nancy and Cassandra and Lisa I think have some items that hopefully we can weigh in on um, I guess I think it's a time where it's really important for us to be focusing on reinforcing the most effective needed education agenda for Michigan. Um, and whether that's reminding people and working hard to reinforce the importance of the rigorous high school Michigan merit curriculum, uh, keeping a standard-based MEEP, uh, reinforcing the need for a budget for the department and for other things like college access that we talked about. Um, these are important um, agendas for us to keep working hard to make clear. I'm worried we're sort of losing control of the agenda of what education needs to look like a bit in Michigan. And we've made recommendations as a board on policy and budget 
The governor has made recommendations on policy and budget. There's a healthy amount of overlap. I'm a little concerned that the legislature appears to be saying whatever, and in some cases sort of plucking stuff out of the sky, uh, and uh, some of which can be very damaging. So I hope we can have a thoughtful discussion about what the agenda needs to be and how we can help the legislature um, find the, the true path. Thanks, John. <clears throat> you know, as part of my report, I'll abbreviate a little bit also, but I wanted to speak a little bit further on an analogy in the medical profession with the counseling discussion we had. And uh, the, I was just thinking I'd like to build a little more on the analogy of the medical profession and what we can think of as the counseling profession that I alluded to. I mean, I, I've been involved in Cleveland Clinic for a couple of years now, and one of the things I note is that if, that I think is similar to counseling if we go to Patrick's comment earlier about the fact that um, they even have the sign-off with Brandy and MCAN about not trading these off to professional counselors, that these are supplementary. And I think if we can think about it like the medical profession, I might spend four hours at the clinic and it's only the last half hour that I'm with a doctor often. And, but I'm very comfortable with all the other professionals that have been involved who have, who if anything, frankly, I think do their part of the job as well or maybe better because they become specialists in it. So, you know, everything from check-in to then uh, how you doing now and questionnaires and that, that to some degree is a totally different perspective. So I, I think that's what we have to try to head towards is that an analogy similar to that and probably more so in the whole profession. You know, this might be even part of our finance study is, is what is it we want to make sure teachers are preserved to do as opposed to where computers might help and technology might help or parapros could help. A lot of parapros I think are very underutilized in our, in our work. Many of them are trained teachers by the way and it's, it's the job market to some degree. So you have a fair amount of elementary teachers that are actually parapros because there aren't, uh, th th there's more supply than demand. Uh, so anyway, I just wanted to kind of close that loop. I think I left that analogy hanging a little bit earlier. Um, NASB, I thought it was interesting. You probably noticed the same thing, but the NASB publication on online learning gave two shout outs to Michigan, one on the online experience that they've, they've dropped now that we were the first because that gets old after a while, and, but we're still one of only three in Michigan, and then they also talked about, uh, exclusively about us with seat time waivers and the way that we're moving cyber education in a thoughtful way, in a way that's trying to pilot issues and, and see results uh, as the board's position and the department's position has been to give this uh, a couple of years to, to see the results. I thought that was a nice shout out that we don't always get. Um, I guess two just well, I did a Holland school visit uh, I, I, uh, this month. Uh, I, I feel like I commend to you each month the one I've gone to most recently, and you can't make all these, but a really impressive use in the elementary level of iPads in pilot programs, not just buying one for everyone and then say go at it, because people don't know what to do when that means go at it. But when you see an established veteran teacher of 20 years who was scared to death but volunteered for this program, and the way she's using this in her instruction now, it's we're going to highlight it in our, uh, uh, what do we call that, Marty? The Education, Education Connection asked her to write an article about this because this is how you're really going to see veteran teachers who, uh, I'm like this. I mean, it's fearful until you understand it and can work with it. And now she says she'd never go back. You know, she's found a way to integrate this in her classroom in a real way, and you wouldn't even recognize it other than the four walls. You wouldn't recognize this as a classroom, really. So that might be a stop if you're ever on the west side that you'd, I think you'd enjoy. And then finally, I, you know, somewhat self-serving, but I think it's a compliment to you that Arnie Duncan wrote me a hand note and said the board made a really good decision in their renewal of the state superintendent. So I thought I'd <laughs> pass that on to you. Um, so I'm good. Paul. Uh, Mike, yes, ma'am. I want to ask a question about the uh, human resources report we get. Oh. Yes, please. Whoops. Uh, we, we've been fortunate enough to be able to bring on some new staff. 
And I don't. I assume they're replacing other people. I don't know if they're additional staff or not. But I wondered if we could get some information on who these people are, what their experience was, and what they're going to be doing here. Yeah, let's do that. Um, who can give me some help on that? Carol had to, she mentioned at 1.30 she had to yeah. go down for that conference call. Well, I don't have to know specifically, I would just in general, it would be helpful to get that. I find, I think it would be helpful to get that kind of information about the people that yeah. are now doing with some of the work. We never know who they are, and sometimes they show up here, most of the time they don't. That's a good idea. I mean, the job. <laughs> right, they're doing their job, but I, what is their job? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. We just reinstituted because we lost this for a little bit that um, trying to make sure that I'm meeting new folks as they come in and we lost track of that for a little bit and we're just reinstituting. Maybe what we should do, we, we, we kind of had this at one time here that periodically we would bring every quarterly, every yeah. quarter for instance, people in and just give a little time to speak about their background and what they're doing. And we have been able to um, well, assuming that the governor's budget holds and not the one that uh, one of the committees threw out, yeah. that uh, that we're that at least we won't be cutting, and then we have a fair number of replacements. So why don't we do that? Why don't we um, maybe next meeting we could start with trying to catch up with some of the folks, that put a name and a face, and we I could, think. Yeah, yeah, and we could institutionalize that every quarter, let's say. But we we had that for a bit, and then we kind of. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I'm not, I'm not looking at you. This is me more than I am. <laughs> yeah, you're, <laughs> but that would be good. I think they'd appreciate it. I try to do it, as you can see, when they're in the I room. I know, when I someone's try to, here, you tell us, but. But know, yeah, that's different than. A couple of them. Yeah, why don't, if, that, if that makes sense, we'll do that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Paul. Okay. Thank you. Um, just want to highlight a couple things. I think one of the uh, great uh, activities that our students have been able to be involved in uh, in Oakland County, and it's been replicated in a couple others as well, is the Global Trade Mission. And the Global Trade Mission is a three-day event where students come from across the county, are put in cross-county uh, cross teams, if you will, so they are immediately thrown into a group of people that they are unfamiliar with, have to immediately form a bond, and uh, do a tremendous amount of work before their presentation occurs to a group of investors uh, on Saturday morning. And uh, the, the key to element for this year's theme was, uh, um, and the goal for the mission was entrepreneurship and innovation through market diversification. So since 98, uh, over 2,000 young people have been involved in this program and uh, some of the key sponsors, and there are many, many of them, but uh, Automation Alley has been involved, Oakland Schools, along with Oakland Community College. So we are able to take over a wing of the college there and they're on the campus where they're able to work with it and they have collaboration from business uh, experts uh, obviously uh, government officials are involved with it and they have to deal with all of the rapidly changing circumstances of the international marketplace and the end result is a presentation of their business plan to a group of investors who then uh, invest into what they would if they had the real money to do so for these young people and give them some critiques. And we were very fortunate. This young lady here is a student of, of all of ours at the technical campus. Uh, this is Zofia Martin. Uh, she is a senior. She's been in our program for two years. She attends Berkeley. And she was on the gold medal winning Exportsmanship Award. And this doesn't mean that she earned the most amount of money with her team. What it means is over these three days, they looked at a lot of those areas that uh, business and industry are looking for as well, the soft skills, the teamwork, how did we problem solve. And so all of that is a three-day evaluation. And uh, Zofia is, uh, was a member of that winning team and uh, just a great opportunity for her and her teammates uh, through this particular project. And I think it's one of the best ones that, uh, that students can get involved in. So we met her, correct? You did. You yes. saw a video of Zofia, yeah. Yes, we did. And you met her at the we campus. She's yes. The one with all the yes, you did. Yes. She was charming. Yeah, she's, she's, a great, uh, she's a great young lady. And uh, she does a lot of different things. There's no doubt about it. Very talented. So that was a global trade mission, and, uh, and uh, we had that. We had our open house, which I always enjoy uh, at the technical campus because we are able to um, have young people. And when we talk about planning, and we were looking at where this is, we have 
uh, parents and seventh and eighth graders that are coming through the campus to figure out as they're looking where their career interests will lie, how will they meet uh, the requirements and, and work with to uh, have their end goal of being college and career ready. And so we had that in early March as well and uh, had an opportunity to attend the uh, um, Integrating Student Growth Data Conference here in Lansing, which obviously is a major component as uh, Mike has indicated as teachers are looking at the evaluation models and where we're at. And there's a lot of great things that uh, people have worked on and put together uh, for the uh, evaluation purposes dealing with student achievement. And so it was a good conference for myself to attend, my colleagues, because we as in Oakland schools have also submitted a, um, an evaluation instrument for consideration uh, for our staff and for what we're doing there. So uh, another good month, another busy month. and. Um, those are just a couple of highlights that I wanted to uh, share with you today. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Speaking of conference, don't forget, a week from Monday, Monday morning, uh, we're going to have our own John and Nancy keynoting at the Governor's Summit. I think that's the AM, correct? I think so. Yeah. Um, let's see. Lisa, you're on, and John kind of set the stage for this. It's Lisa and Nancy and um, have some meaty stuff today. Good, good afternoon. I thought I would start with talking quickly about May. I just wanted to let you know we, um, that the House subcommittees on school aid and MDE budget, those are actually two separate subcommittees, although there's only two members difference between the two, but they're both expecting to come and uh, join you for a joint meeting at the May meeting in the morning. And I'm working with Mertz and with the House Fiscal Staff, who are the, essentially the committee clerks, um, on the logistics. Yes. yes. Um, so that's still a go. Cool. Good. I think the plan tentatively is right at 9.30, right? We would start with... Their usual meeting time is at 10.30, and I haven't been able to, oh. to get from them whether they prefer 9.30 or 10.30 or what, what, you know, how that works with... Start at 9.30 anyway, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. We can work around there. Yeah. Um, <coughs> there's quite a few things in my report, and there were a couple that weren't in it that I wanted to mention. The, the curriculum piece is not in the report, but you're going to be getting um, an email from me later today with uh, further information. Plus, I know we were planning on talking it, about it at the subcommittee, legislative subcommittee of the board, which is actually this coming Monday. And during the next... This coming Monday, because this coming Monday... Um, uh, the 16th? Oh, that's right. The uh, governor's summit is this coming Monday. No. That's the next Monday. I'm sorry. By then, I should know, I'm hoping that I'll at least have an idea of what the schedule is in the House and Senate in terms of when they plan on having public testimony and when they plan on holding hearings on the actual curriculum bills versus others. And so we'll be able to, at the subcommittee, talk a lot more about the curriculum piece. Um, on the budget, obviously, the two thing, two, the three big things to note are one was the hit to the state board office superintendent's line item in the Senate of $500,000. That's a 36% cut and would surely mean layoffs um, within the within the office. Um, having said that, you know, I don't Greg's know. Greg's going to protect us, though, on that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think the no pressure. <laughs> I, the governor's office and the budget office, I don't believe, are supportive of those changes. And uh, uh, so we're hoping to um, have the House's version um, win out the battle, so to speak. Um, the other two things are related, sort of. Um, one is the performance-based funding in general. Um, the House didn't include it at all, while the House's subcommittee version um, didn't it wasn't that they opposed the, the idea of performance funding so much as they didn't like uh, the idea of doing it yet with the current testing and wanted to invest more in technology for the schools at this time than in, in the performance grants itself. The Senate, on the other hand, kept performance funding but did it by scrapping the MEEP test by next fall. 
and starting an entirely new uh, computer adaptive test, even though over the next, as you know, for the last two years, we've been working towards a computer adaptive test um, along with many states nationally and in a thoughtful way, in an orderly way, so that it's not disruptive to students and teachers. And so that's what we're going to continue to push as we move forward um, with the budget. So that was a big issue. Um, and I know the performance funding piece in particular is uh, of, of concern to you as you supported the concept along with the governor's office. Cassandra. Have we had any conversations with the feds yet about what that would mean for our Title I funding? Um, it, it would mean a lot of things. Uh, number one, the, the, the computer adaptive tests that are out there now um, don't have accommodations for students with disabilities. So immediately we're in trouble on IDEA and in violation of that. Um, there's also issues with Title I in terms of not having a test that's aligned with our content standards. So that's 600 million in Title I funding. Um, there's a number of issues and I have a, um, some information that I'm going to email you and um, get to you today still on specifically on that point. Good question, Ellen. Mm -hmm. It's a huge, yeah. a huge issue. Can I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. Is that something about the performance-based funding analysis that was done by the, you know, by district? Have you got any feedback from the district? So does, are they understanding it better? Well, I mean, the, you know, the disadvantage always of getting the specific data out is then, then the winners love it and the losers don't, you know, to some degree. Yeah. But, but I'd say in fairness to those that didn't have funding at this point, it's a third of 1%. Um, they get that they believe, many at least that we've heard from, believe that uh, part of the future is going to be based on tying it into student achievement growth. The key being, you know, one thing, we feel, uh, not just saying this because Greg's sitting here, but we do feel uh, happy that the governor asked us to develop, Joseph and his team, to develop the metric, Joseph, Vanessa, and the rest, rather than pull it off a shelf or have some, you know, less, less worthy, I guess I would say, uh, outfit put it together. So it gives tremendous, it gives, it gives extra points, as you remember, reviewing it here for those that have taking the toughest kids, you know, that are the most behind and helping them improve. So we think for such a small investment, it's, you know, I appreciate when the board supported this concept, is first of all, it's a small part of the funding, a third of one percent. But secondly, it's this issue where you, you, you almost drive individual school districts that we sometimes forget when we're here. I mean, they ultimately make the decisions on counseling <laughs> ratios and all the rest that they, it probably drives them to think more about their lowest performing kids that have the greatest challenges the way that metric was put together. And even though it's not a ton of money, it's, it's, it's compared to what? I mean, if you don't have that, you've left some money on the table and you might have to, I don't know, cut middle school band or something that would be painful. <coughs> so, um, Hey, Dan, we're picking up a little of your family reunion, it sounds like, just so you know. Thanks. Sorry. Good now. Dad is good. So, you know, the, the, the reaction is mixed, but this was also historical data. We don't have data for this year. So I think, I mean, I met with ISD superintendents a couple of weeks ago, and they have a pretty good ear to the ground on it. And they, they think that people understand that we need to have a piece of the action there. And then also that um, they understand this is data from last year, and we obviously don't have the data for this year. To so there's there's hope with those that didn't get funds. And then I don't know if I emphasized this enough at an earlier meeting, but our guys caught something that I think you know that in the best sense I should say with Greg. I mean on the phone there was a lot of deliberation at the very last minute on the budget related to the wording, and the fact that was caught the word average change the whole dynamic so that all schools are eligible for this money. Had you used the word average, it by definition would have meant about, you know, I mean average isn't medium, but about half or half could get it and half couldn't. So I think it, that helped a lot. That helped the dynamic of understanding everyone has access to the funds and
Um, uh, continuing on, um, I put in a note on a, a higher ed bill. Um, I know uh, there is interest by the board on higher ed. It's not tip something that we typically follow, although we are lead agency on this bill. Um, it's received a great deal of testimony and it's been a pretty emotional debate on it, but it has to do um, with the counseling, with the preparation of counselors at colleges and um, changing, uh, prohibiting universities from um, penalizing or discriminating against a student who says, I don't want to counsel a particular student for um, my own um, sincerely held religious belief. Um, the, the bill was reported from committee. Initially it was going to be just for a hearing was my understanding, but it was reported. I don't know that it's moving any farther or if it passes one chamber, if it's going to go any farther than that. As I said, I think it was more to draw attention to the issue and it's an issue that's in court. So I also think there's some sens sensitivity by the legislators about whether or not to weigh in when um, the other branch of government is currently taking a look at it. Uh, on the kindergarten starting age, which we talked about last month, uh, something came up after the discussion of the board that I wanted to note, which was um, as we discussed and as we looked further at the bill, um, the issue about whether or not a waiver should be included, a locally determined waiver on, on children, whether they start in September or December, what, when their birthday is by. And there is no readily available simple to administer readiness test currently out there. Um, plus it would create um, a vast difference depending on which district you lived in, how that would apply to your child. And further, given the, the high stakes in terms of competition and schools of choice, um, it's conceivable that you could have one school who says, no, we don't believe your child is ready, and another school say, oh yeah, we do, because they want to get the child in figuring that once they're there, they're going to continue staying there and they'll get the foundation allowance for K through whatever. Um, because of that, the staff recommended not supporting the waiver, um, mostly because it's just not, there's not a reliable um, test out there. And so it, stating otherwise, implying that there is some way of determining whether a particular child um, can be waived into this group or out of it um, is a falsehood. Further, um, if they are changing this date, there's a more technical issue, which is they have to change the date in Great Start either. Otherwise, the children born in those three months can't do either. Right. They can no longer be in kindergarten and they can't be in Great Start. So we had to point out to them, you have to change the dates in both or you're leaving those kids um, vulnerable because they can't get the, the services. And I think the legislature is open to that. Um, I'm not sure where they're going to land on the waiver piece yet. But it, it appears at, it, it's split, I think. The legislature is split? <laughs> Sorry, that was messy. <laughs> um, the other really big thing I wanted to note is, has to do with a federal issue that isn't in here, but I wanted to um, raise it so that we could talk about it in subcommittee and just bring, put it on your radar, which is sequestration. As you know, there was a super committee com uh, set up at the federal level to look at debt and the idea was that they would come up with a way to either raise money or cut funding, uh, cut uh, funding in various programs, but they would figure out a way to balance everything and if they failed to act, the legislation said then automatically in January there would be across the board cuts to all discretionary programming. This would be huge for education. I know that uh, NASB and CCSSO, and you probably heard a lot about it for those of you that went to DC this last month, uh, that's their, one of their biggest concerns and they're pushing hard on Congress, knowing it probably won't get done pre-election, but with any luck during the lame duck so that the January cuts don't happen. But it may be something that you want to weigh in on via um, a resolution to Congress or a resolution um, to, to both the um, uh, Congressional and Senate delegation of Michigan. What is the amount of, is it 10%? I believe it's 10% across the board. Those were the big updates that I had from the written report. 
Nancy, did you? Uh, I, yeah, you yes. I yep. don't want to interrupt. Okay. At our, <coughs> at our last uh, legislative committee meeting, we uh, talked about several of the items that we wanted to respond to, but then in the interim, the legislature, in its inimitable wisdom, uh, brought it even more to our attention. And so rather than have one resolution after another, I've kind of created an omnibus resolution that at the moment speaks um, to everything that's currently going on in the legislature. And I want to emphasize that the, the way I have um, the way I've crafted this is in a positive way for two reasons. One, I don't think it does any good to to do the shame on you kind of um, vernacular. I don't think that gets us anywhere. But two, we don't know how many of these things are actually going to move and how many of these things are actually going to become true serious legislative pieces. So I have tried to put this in a way that um, is inclusive but not so exclusive that we spend a lot of time uh, mincing words over particular pieces of legislation. So I'm going to hand out what I have here. It's a lot wordier than I had last time. So um, let's see here. There's some to you and the rest over here. But I am going to read it out loud just because I want everybody to know what this says. The State Board of Education and the Department of Education agree with the governor and the legislature that Michigan's children and the education system of the state have been, are, and will be the hope of the future in our state's economy, community involvement, quality of life, and culture that we support and desire. More importantly, however, the State Board of Education and Michigan Department of Education believe in our children and their right to pursue their hopes and dreams and achieve at the highest le levels possible. In short, we believe that the very founding principles of this country, that every person has a right to pursue, pursue their goals and achieve them, is still what separates us from so many other cultures. In order to provide the capacity to students for realizing these goals, the State Board of Education believes and has adopted clear policy on rigorous grade level content expectations, high school course content expectations and graduation requirements, state assessments that provide insight into student achievement and student growth, which then allow educators the ability to address their students' needs and parents to understand where their students stand, and a strong Michigan Department of Education that provides support and oversight of the State Board of Education policy, state, and federal legislation. We believe it is imperative that these clear and decisive policies be upheld to provide that very capacity to our students they so richly deserve and have a right to pursue. To do otherwise would be to deny our students the ability to be successful in the life they choose upon graduation and for their future. In a world where our students will not only change their jobs on the average of seven times, but more importantly will change careers on an average of seven times, our responsibility as a statewide elected board is to provide opportunity and capacity for all of our students to succeed upon graduation and into their future. We can do no less, and the State Board of Education will stand by their policies and current legislation supporting our policies. Michigan has children that can reach their dreams. Our children have the intelligence to meet these rigorous standards. And we have the educators who, when given the opportunity to redesign the delivery of our education system, can provide this high quality education to all of our students. We invite our parents and our community to believe in their children and their ability to reach high and succeed. We invite the legislature to join us in this support and uphold the current state board policies and legislation that supports these policies. So I, I need thoughts on this and if you want to edit so be it but I've tried to keep this general like I said to make sure that we encompassed everything but not focused on nitpicky stuff that we don't know yet if it's even going to make it out of committee. Thanks Nancy. John? Well, I, I, I really like what you're doing here Nancy and also if um, if you had been at Philadelphia in 1776 <laughs> Jefferson would have had been, had been muscled aside for the declaration authorship <laughs> here. Uh, lucky for him. Um, so my only um, concern or, or issue is just I want to make sure that in uh, adopting this sort of statement of reaffirming our policies, we're somehow um, translating for the current legislature that by this we mean things like 
you know, keep a, the MEEP, um, keep the rigorous content standards. You, you understand my point. Yeah, the, that's yeah. so if, if we can make sure that that is how this is interpreted as a clear statement uh, and a positive statement of what's important, then I, I certainly am absolutely all for it. Cassandra? I, I mean, it's, it's, a nice, it's a very nice statement, and it's definitely positive. Um, I, I, don't, I don't understand, though, what we're saying. Um, it's, it doesn't seem to, like, I don't, you, you mentioned that the, the MEEP was in here, but I don't get that from this. And we believe, let's see, where have I, blah, 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 blah. We have provided the capacity to students to realize these goals, third paragraph. And we have adopted clear policy and we're asking them, telling them we will maintain that adoption. And it talks about the state assessments that provide insight into, into student achievement, the high school graduation requirements, the co course content expectations. Those are all things that we've passed and we're not backing down from it. I don't know how much clearer to make that. Well, maybe uh, to say MEEP. You know. Sure, but there's more than MEEP. There's MEEP, Michigan Merit Exam. They're the, they're the, ex they're the assessments that we use for. I'm sorry, Joseph. I can't remember the the, my access. Thank you exams. I can list all of those if you'd like me to. But see, they're not talking about cutting those, are they? Yes. Not yet. I'm making yes, not are. yet. I'm making clear that we have no intention of backing down on any of our policies that we have adopted that address these issues. That everything we have passed is for purpose and reason, mm -hmm. and not just frivolous. Gosh, I think this sounds good. I I guess you know when you first read it, I um, I like the statement. I I like. Uh, reaffirming that we're standing by our policy but I just I wasn't sure what this is in connection with and there, I'm wondering if they might also can I can I ask Lisa to respond to that because I you know my guess is she might have some thoughts on how this could be interpreted well, yeah I, I wonder before you do that oh, okay go ahead I, I wondered if if this is direction to the staff, but this is not necessarily going, would this go to the legislator? Absolutely. Well, then I think we need more specifics. What I was thinking was this is a great opening statement, and then we add to it as, as bills come up, and it, uh, since these are the ones that are up now, that we, that we have something that says we don't want them to substitute an off-the-shelf test for me, that would be disaster. <laughs> Make a specific, I mean, keep this, but then add a second statement that gives some of the specifics to the current legislation, and as other things come up, add to it. I, I can do that, but I, uh, we can do that. Um, the reason I did not specifically mention specific bills is, first of all, there are so many of them right now that m m would make the head spin. Um, Secondly, I think that by doing that, what you're doing is you're focusing them only on what they've thought of, and I was trying to be much more inclusive than that, but I'm happy to put that in but if you I want think to. they might not know what all our policies are, even though you say it in here. But it's sort of I, I can list the, ass the assessments. I've got that down already. I have no problem listing assessments. That's no problem. Well, that would be helpful. I yeah. Think. Because, I mean, we have to play clear that this is, this is not a thing to do, especially in light of the fact that there's going to be a new, new assessments that we've been working on in, the, exactly. in, in a year. It doesn't make any sense at all. They may not be aware of that. I mean, they should be. <laughs> You've testified before them and all that, but who knows what they listen. So, you know, they're coming up with this stuff. It's just out of the blue. Okay. It's not the first group. There were, there were senators in the last session who, wrote, who also wanted to take it off the shelf. I remember that. It's, you know, they keep doing these things. Mm -hmm. So I think your general statement is a good idea. But I think we also have to something, this would be good for Lisa, if you understand what it means, and go and lobby for the specifics. But if this is going to go to the legislators, I think they have to have something that they can really focus on. And I think we need to take this individually to the legislature, too. And I think in doing that, then you sit down and explain to them, let me tell you about this. Let me tell you about what our high school graduation 
requirements do and why and what, why we've done what we've done. Let me tell you about our assessments and why we've done what we've done. Let me tell you about the department and why it's so important that we maintain the strength there. Otherwise, all the stuff that you're saying has to happen won't happen. I mean, you, you, that you, I could, we could write a 20-page tome here, literally, on everything that's coming up and for the legislature right now. Mm -hmm. They aren't going to read it. No. So I try to encapsulate this on one page with the knowledge that in order to make this live, to have life, it had to be one-on-one, -on -one, and it had to be Lisa, and it had to be us, and it had to be anybody else that we can get to go and, and uh, be supportive with us because uh, th <laughs> there is so much out there right now. And my guess is that if you talk to a good number of them and explain this to them, they had no idea that what they did was undoing what, yeah. they, what in fact it would be undoing. Right, I think that's true. So I, I, I agree with you, this does not have specifics, but by next week or tomorrow, the specifics that we might put in here today may no longer exist and have something new. So that's why that's I tried why to I focus that's on... That's why I thought we should have an extra, you know, keep this right. and have an extra... Right, and we can do that. We can have an extra sheet too. In fact, I think we'll get that later today from Lisa is to talking points to specific pieces, which I thought would accompany this. Oh, well that would be... That's yeah. what I had in mind. Yeah, so I think that that's all right. Yeah. I, I that, didn't realize that. Well, I didn't either until I walked in here oh, today. So okay. I... but. But that's, I think, um, and that's why I was editing while I was sitting here earlier because I found out what she had available for us. And I thought, well, there's no reason to be redundant. So I think that, that that has to happen. But you're absolutely right. Unless we have specifics from those talking points, mm -hmm. this is a nice statement, but it's not going to stand on its own. Right. So. Cassandra, then Richard, then Lisa. Or uh, you were John, I just thought. Uh, yeah, go ahead. No. I'm fine. Um, I'm, I'm not entirely certain whether this is uh, intended to um, a, appeal to our emotions and idealism or is it to appeal to our, um, our uh, common sense uh, and, uh, and, and intellect here. Whatever works with you, Richard. That's what <laughs> we're designing it to appeal to. Yeah. Um, now, the state, you know, we believe in our children and the right to pursue their hopes and dreams and achieve the highest possible level. Uh, I know that resonates with a lot of people, uh, but I, I, don't, I don't think it's true. Uh, ask kids what their aspirations are. Uh, get rich quick and not have to work anymore. Or, or you know, uh, or win on, uh, uh, you know, America's Got Talent or, or something <laughs> along that line. Uh, we project our dreams onto our children, and that, which is why this, this rhetoric is so appealing to us adults. Um, so um, I guess I, I, would, I would recast that uh, appeal into we believe in our children and, uh, and their, their right to... Um, for, to achieve the highest levels possible, because let's face it, you know, I was a kid that needed prodding to do that, and uh, I, I had a few of my own uh, as well. So I, I think that uh, if we if we uh, put it down a not, notch so that uh, uh, it's more um, nuts and bolts kind of thing, because that's what the that's what the legislative issues that we're really dealing with are. I mean, I'd, I'd call me naive, but I think that uh, the legislators who voted for an off-the-shelf test honestly thought that would be a better test uh, than the MEEP test, because they, they thought the free market would develop a better test than a, than a, than a bureaucracy. Um, isn't that a loaded way of putting it? Um, <laughs> and, but to uh, have a free market, you'd have to have hopes and dreams of being able to develop that. Well, <laughs> I have something that will sell, which is, which is why we've got... Uh, which is why DVDs overtook uh, beta there. But, um, By the way, we resemble that remark. Okay, right there, I hear you. And markets are creations of public policy, Richard. There have to be rules. And, and, that's, and that's the point, isn't it? What are, the, what are the rules that and are the The rules should be it has to meet our standards in the common core. That's uh, the rule that we would lay down. Yeah. And, and that's what I think is kind of missing right. here. I, think, here. I, think it's, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was just taking no, you advantage. Clarify. Yeah. 
clarify but, this, did you? Um, is there a way? Um, I, could, I, w could I respond sure. to that just a second here? Okay. Here's the thing, though, Richard. And just, you know me, I'm going to be perfectly blunt here. There are those who truly believe our children are not capable of achieving at high levels. They truly believe our children are not able to meet their hopes and dreams. And so we need to dumb everything down to meet their capacity. And I'm going to challenge, and I always will challenge, this legislature to look at what could be, not to what they are willing to cast our children as only able to do. And that's why that rhetoric to me is important because I believe that I need to challenge them to tell me, you're right, our children aren't as smart as kids in other states. They can't do this. And I will not allow that to happen if I can help it. And I will not, I do not believe this, this board would want to have that happen either. And so I think sometimes hopes and dreams have to be there in order to show people that we we cannot determine for every second grader in this state whether or not they will be successful in life or not because we haven't yet given them the full capacity to try and to show otherwise or to be successful. And I think that's what this board policy did. When we passed this in 2004 and 5, what we did was we gave the sky was the limit and you now can reach as high as possible. We did not limit what kids could or could not succeed at. And I think that's one of the things that is in danger here of being stopped. And so whereas a child may not have a hope and dream of being what we would have them be, the fact that they even have the hope and dream of going on um, Dancing for the Stars or whatever, means that we've allowed them to have that. We haven't said, no, you're not able. And so that's why this language to me is important. It may ultimately need to be changed, but I just wanted you to know why I said, why I said it the way I did. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. John, Eileen, um, Lisa? Is it uh, pot? I'm sorry. And then Dan. <laughs> and then Cassandra. I've got a, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to jump off. Um, did you want to? A little. Did, did you want to comment at all, Dan, first before you do that, or are you good? I did two quick things. Um, I'll be very, very quick. Uh, my apologies to whoever's placed on me serving uh, in the queue. One is, hey, Dan. Um, no. Nancy, I just want to commend you on not, so I, I get what you are feeling, um, and uh, it resonates completely with me. I'm not sure whether it's resonating with me, with, you know, with the logic or the inspiration or what have you, but I'm inspired. Um, I just want to commend you. <laughs> Inspiring. I think it's great. Um, uh, and a fine use of uh, kind of the bully pulpit um, uh, that is your seat. Um, and then secondly, uh, I think I do. So from uh, from my perspective, I would maybe one way to solve this problem would be to offer up an example. Um, so kind of you lay down this statement, which I think we generally agree with. Um, you know that we have. We have, we have set a direction um, and we are intending to maintain that direction. And so, for example, um, our intention is to, you know, use the Smarter Balance Assessment, you know, when it comes online and to switch assessments now for an interim period is to, you know, is, is inconsistent with that intention. Just as an example, kind of a you know parenthetical example, but it gets to the point of those who need that particular thing to be mentioned. And also, I think um, it's another way to do it as opposed to just listing all of the assessments. Although, I mean, that's fine as well. Um, uh, so anyway, I, so with those two points, I think it's a great statement. Um, I, there probably are ways to uh, meet the needs of those who want that particular thing called out. Um, uh, and that's that's all I've got. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, thanks, Dan. I think my, my um, question slash recommendation was in that vein, meaning is it possible to attach now, uh, maybe with Lisa's help or others, um, a, a set of statements at the end here that basically repeat the kind of thing you were suggesting, Dan, consistent with this statement. That is why we at the State Board you know, support using the um, 
fair balance assessment and oppose replacing it. Uh, what are the three or four or five most important things for us to say right now, given what's most real in what the legislature is proposing? Uh, we support performance um, funding based on growth and encourage that to be re, you know, reanimated. We oppose uh, changes to the rigor of our Michigan Merit curriculum or, or say it in an affirmative way as Dan did with the assessment. I think a series of those three or four or five at the end, and we might, you know, replace these <laughs> next month uh, with the, the things that we really must speak out on, but I think that would be uh, helpful perhaps in meeting both the, the broader directionals here, stay the course, which is what I was trying to say, Nancy, mm -hmm. us elegantly. We need, to st we need to reaffirm the direction of the most effective education program for Michigan, which is what you laid out, and then we need to speak to the specifics of how current legislation does or does not advance that. And if I may, okay. before... I'm be signing off. I'll, I'll call back in at 3. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, And I, before I lean, if I could just add one that is, can be said in a, uh, in a more inspirational way than this, but... I'm somewhat serious. It's like 95% of the department is funded by the feds. There won't be anyone left to go over to the depart to the legislature when they want us to interact we with them. The budget requisite to <laughs> be able to implement and yeah. manage the and almost the perspective. Education. I think it's just they see a building. First of all, we're only a small portion of this building. They have this impression that there's all these folks. There's a handful of us, mm -hmm. and they're ready to take half of it. And, I mean, there's a point, I'm, I'm actually not being sarcastic to say, I have no one to send over to meet with you and talk to you because everyone's a federal employee here and we report basically to Arnie. You know, I mean, that's, yeah. I, I should they say report to, but we're funded by, and remember a few years ago when, correctly, yes. really, we didn't like it because we had to make a lot of layoffs, but from my point of view, we should have been able to charge off part, part of the deputies, for example, to federal money because of, gigantic part of their work is doing that but it was ruled not so and we would have lost our federal money so that all had to come out remember we had to lay off a bunch of people in order to offset that I'm the only one that 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 from in fairness to the feds would say we well, have to have a state soup under the Constitution so you can't charge any of his to that but everyone else I wish we could have prorated but we can't mm -hmm. and then there's hundreds of those that full time full percentage of their funding is federal money which, so I, 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 as much as Lisa has tried this and we've tried it, I, I think a more carefully worded than I just said, but a thoughtful statement about that proportionality might wait, be a wake-up call. That I, I'm kind of serious. I, who are we going to send if you need some help? Mm -hmm. Or if you just even want to have us test They okay. don't need help. <laughs> they know it all. So are those the four... Uh, we should say something specific at the end. Con Assessments, graduation requirements, staff, and what else? And the performance funding. That the 95 percent of the department oh. is federally funded. Yeah. Uh, Eileen, please. Sorry, and then Cassandra, and then Lisa. This is uh, <coughs> deja vu all over again. Um, I remember so long ago, it's hard to imagine I'm this old, but I remember 15 years ago, um, when I was on the State Arts Council, which was at that time one of only three citizen panels in the state, on elected two Film Council, State Council, or the Michigan Council for the Arts and Cultural Affairs, and the State Board of Education. One of the problems that we've got in how we function is that um, we forget that we're an unusual situation for state government. The university boards are not the same as the State Board of Ed, okay? So there's always a fundamental lack of understanding about why that is. And um, people see Nancy, they see staff, but that's not the same as understanding what we do. They don't have a role for us like the legislature has a role that they understand, okay? In addition to that, there have been some um, publicized issues that the board has been settling out quite well, I think, but uh, there may be, this may be in part a reaction to things that didn't happen in the last two months. And I, what I don't want to do in this is to, I want to tell them what our role is, but I don't want to seem to be lecturing. And um, this is less telling them what needs to be than who we are, mm -hmm. okay? I'd rather tell them what needs to happen. In other words, I'd rather, I'd rather tell them, rather than saying, you know, we've done this and we've done this and we're the right ones and you're not, I'd rather just simply say we're working together on behalf of children 
And these are the things that need to take place. And I can give you a draft of some reductions just so you can see what I'm saying, the differences. There's nothing wrong with this, but it's not as compelling and it's not, as, it's not what I think they need to see. In other words, it's, it's, it, we're saying the right things, but I think if they read it, they won't get what we want them to see. Does that make sense? No, but go ahead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so even with the... And I don't... Um, I, it, it, this isn't meant for a trial, public trial in any way, but in the third paragraph, um, I would just substitute something like the State Board of Ed after extensive consultation or extensive work with Michigan citizens, educators, parents, and employers has adopted clear and rigorous K-12 standards that are, have been supported, are similar to other states, and something, something like that. And, and then that gets away from all, it, it, it says the same things, it talks about students and parents, but it says that we did what they do, which is that we held public hearings in 2005, essentially, okay? So, uh, th and they would understand that. Nancy, I'm oh, sorry, I, I'm just going to drop it. But no, I no, would, no. I would I'm say, I'm, I'm concentrating, I'm focusing. Okay, yeah. um, I would say that we could achieve the same things in here with about half the language, and we wouldn't. They would read it and say, "Oh, I see what the parallel is to what we do. They did that work, and then can tell them what what it is that we see that needs to be done differently." I think that would get us where we want to go, and um, it would start putting us on a footing that they understand. Mm -hmm. Cassandra. Um, I, I agree with that, and I was actually going to wordsmith just a little bit. Um, I think it does rely very heavily on our what we believe, and if that's what we want to say, that's completely fine with me. But I just a couple things that I would ask that we consider maybe removing to tighten it up a little bit. Uh, the one being in the second paragraph, at the very end, just remove the statement says, it's still what separates us from so many other cultures. I just think it's, you know, it kind of turns a positive, maybe a little more into a, a negative, and it's not necessary. Um, and then in the last paragraph, the line that says, we invite our parents and our community to believe in their children and their ability to reach high and succeed. I would feel more comfortable if we didn't have that in there, just because I don't want to invite a parent to believe in their child. I think that they do. Um, and so I think it's not necessarily, it's not a necessary statement, so I would feel comfortable, more comfortable if we removed it. And, uh, further. I'm sorry. John, please. I'm not, was invite, we invite the legislators, could also be seen as a little patronizing, I think. For Eileen's, we asked the legislature. But I guess my major point is I, I'd like to see us, I, I want us to agree on some language, however, we get there, and, and with whatever the four notes at the end, so that we can pass this. So I'm just eager to support a path, uh, Nancy, that mm -hmm. no, uh, gets us there, um, if you can see it. Yeah, I, I thought the word invite was far less demanding than ask, but I'm happy to go to ask if we need to go to ask. If others are comfortable, I just I was I was now listening anew to uh, mm -hmm. Eileen's point about we state board in our high and mighty goodness and virtue invite others to join us on the pinnacle of wisdom upon which we sit. <laughs> <laughs> Casting she'd educational. Like, she'd like that language. Yeah, she'd <laughs> like that. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, anyway, we have two policies in the last sentence. You want to get we have two policies. If you want to, we invite the legislature to join us and uphold the current state board policies and legislation that's okay supports those policies. We're supporting mm -hmm. such. We, well, the idea is that we pass policies and to support what, them or something. Right, but what I want to do is differentiate from the legislation that's out there that doesn't support our policies. Yeah, that, okay. that's why I put that in there. We don't have to have that in there if you don't want to. Well, I don't know. We're going to start wordsmithing this. Thing. Sure. Would have been nice to have gotten this last yesterday or something. We would. Yeah, would have been nice if we had gotten this yesterday. Well, it would have been, except I just rewrote it all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah. So 
Sorry, we can have this as a word. We have, you know, several places we say we, we stand by, the, by, by our policies. Yes, we will stand by their policies, and the other places we say we support our policies. <coughs> so do you want to take more of those out? Is that what you're saying? Well, I can I do that. Know. Maybe. One of the key things is we want Emily to pick up what we want the sound bites to be for MERS, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just thinking with Emily there and MERS, sometimes, I mean, that is a compliment, but also seriously, that I think it's synthesized often very well by those new services, and some of this discussion is maybe read there, maybe even more than in what we send over. Yeah. Um, True. So I think it's a, this is a good discussion because I think there's a number of points that are being uh, elucidated. And in the case of the, th the four at the end, I mean, the concreteness of that seems to make sense in addition to the uh, important kind of opening that Nancy's provided. Richard. Um, once I was asked to put a car seat in the car, <laughs> and I, I put it in backwards, and the person who shall, renamed, na who shall remain nameless got into an argument with me as to whether I wanted to kill our child or not. <laughs> our child is kind of a giveaway. <laughs> and um, I think we'd have had a, a more productive discussion, maybe less memorable, um, if if we had agreed that I wanted, I had the best interests of our child in mind, but the means of getting there was <laughs> oh, maybe, we've all been there. <laughs> maybe to find out the policy and how, which way the car seat was supposed to face. And I see a similar thing here. If, you know, we don't want to come off accusing the legislators of not caring about our children or not wanting our children to reach their highest potential, but we do want to call their attention to we think they put the car seat in backwards. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I think Where should I put that in? <laughs> <laughs> Turn the car seat around. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think affirming our common interest um, uh, in uh, what's best for our for our, our children and then pointing out that um, the, on the specifics, and that's where, John, I thought you were very right in terms, we got to spell that out in terms of rules, which, which are the structure, which, uh, which I think w w this would be most productive if we focus on that. Um, you reminded me too while well, Nancy's, I'm just buying time for Nancy to finish her wordsmithing. I'm still waiting um, to hear people, what people want me to take out, so there, I'm... There was, in, in Worcester, Mass, a father put uh, a one kid in the car seat in the car after placing the other car seat uh -huh. on the roof, uh -huh. drove out onto 290, and the car seat tumbled and the baby lived and was fine. Um, and I was picturing doing this myself. You know, I can see how this could happen, juggling two kids, and also, how do you report that to your wife? Yeah. After the police and others come, you know, oh ooh, you yeah. get in serious trouble for something like that. I can't so leave you alone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds familiar. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. So uh, is, the is there a, I mean, I, I would support Nancy sort of just narrating through it the general changes and or specifics that respect everybody's comments and some ideas of what the four bullets might say and then with, and then having something we could make a motion on and uh, approve with license to wordsmith uh, as appropriate. Yeah, I'm happy to wordsmith in whatever way that the, the board would like. I just need to have a little more direction as to what exactly they find. Um, it's, in, it's always interesting, I think, when you have something like this go out in front of a group of people. When you know where you mean, and then yeah. you hear people's response, and it's like, gosh, that isn't what I meant at all. <laughs> so that's yeah. good. I just need, because I thought I knew what I meant here, and I clearly didn't, um, I think then I, I just it. need to know what it is needs to be adjusted. And so I've taken out on the second paragraph, as, as Cassandra suggested, I've put a period after them and taken out is still what separates us from so many other cultures, although I'd love to get that in there, but I won't. 
Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I quite frankly believe that if we list at the bottom the four items that we need to have, that maybe this third paragraph is okay? Is that true or not? I don't like to see me. Well, if that's That'll down be the below bottom. here, the four pieces. Oh, I thought it was assessments at the bottom, too. Okay. No, no, we were going to define that. Okay. Is, is, is that okay? That's great. Okay. I, if I may on that point, I think the beauty of acknowledging the shift to smarter balance is the contamination unfair that's been generated in the field, uh, not with malice, but it's kind of like <laughs> you have to have blame something when things aren't exactly what you want. Mm -hmm. So the MEEP's been a whipping boy for a long time, but in a way we're on the same page in the sense that there won't be the MEEP in a couple of years. So it's, it's almost like we don't want to take on the battle of we're protecting the MEEP because we're agreeing it's going to the kind of test that you want and is already well underway with the $300 million consortium and the Smarter Balance. I think the advantage of that is it doesn't look like, oh, there they are trying to keep the meat. Well, you would have to inform them about this smarter balance, which mm -hmm. they should right. have heard about right. but probably didn't connect. Right. They, I mean, they have through right. us but and through Lisa and, and through Joseph, certainly, but I think the nuance of the MEEP as the placeholder till 14 when, as you've acknowledged, we need the, the using some of their wording even to hear the spirit of what some of you are saying, mm -hmm. that they acknowledge we need some of the very features that this smarter balance yeah. is going to have. <coughs> You're looking funny, so I'm I can take out um, on the uh, one, two, three, fourth paragraph. Can you go back to the third for a sec, though? Oh, I think sure, sure, sure. Eileen made a recommendation about eliminating believes, and the SBE oh. has adopted. Well, I would be trying to distill Nancy's very, very good and emotional, emotionally um, rich. Um, content into something that I know that they could read and get it. So it's it's a much different orientation. But I just want to ask a quick question about smart about um, uh, NWEA. Am I right that there is no writing test? That's correct. So how can they do reading, writing, English? How can they do English language arts and math? They can't for the feds. Uh, they would not be able to. It would not be able to be aligned for some Yeah. Okay, well, or to our right, or, or to our glyph. Yeah. Expectations yeah. So uh, I, I believe that there's a fundamental misunderstanding. Well, could between you say that again? I didn't <laughs> quite follow Well, you. The, the, there was a, a huge jump over talking to the department by the Senate and the House who got a partial understanding of what the NWEA assessment could do. And so they didn't understand the points that Lisa has made already, which is just uh, for for IDEA alone, there could be a $600 million shortfall for the federal government. But more important, it doesn't fit our grade level content expectations or anything that's in No Child Left right, Behind I because it doesn't test writing. Right. So when you look at this, I'm just saying I'd like to get this balanced with the very clear factual information that there's been some a lack of oversight on this and it can't be. Um, I balanced with we get what you want to do and here's who we are and let's pull together on this. Different tone than the way we feel, shall I say. <laughs> I think that's a very constructive way to deal with that piece and it, it, it also, but just for background, I mean there are some that are paying for that on their own and part of their lobbying has been to get this paid for by the state. So they're not as concerned about the fact that we have the issue related to losing the 600 million, that it doesn't match up with the common core, that it doesn't match up with our own core content expectations. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. been a little bit of the, of the mm -hmm. uh, politics behind trying to substitute that test for one that uh, mm -hmm. some and subgroups are using. Yeah, I also want to say that's a, a significant oversight and it shows that we're not working together well with them, or they're, they're not working together well with us because that's something that a phone call to Joseph would have solved in about 15 minutes. So what I'm anxious to do here is to bridge this chasm that we have mm -hmm. and set us up as a parallel professional organization that they want to talk with. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to make sure that the language on this is strong but welcoming. So suggest a way, <laughs> yeah. because 
I thought that's what I had here. So clearly, my perception is not something that's going to carry the day, which is great. But I do need to know then what does appear to you, because I thought this what I thought by inviting that was welcoming, but evidently not. So um, I'm happy to do whatever needs to be done. I just need some suggestions. Well, this is a, it's hard to do this at the table. Right. Is it possible for you to work with? John and or and Lisa to come up. Everybody's heard what we've said. I can do that. Do you want it back yet today? And I can do that too if you want me to. Well, the uh, the Senate's on recess right now, right? They're back so next week. Yeah, they're yeah, back so next it's week. Not critical. Uh, what, well, what how about it? Oh. oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. How about if we said we ha we take down everybody's concerns here and at the legislative committee on Monday you give us license then to yeah. go ahead and recraft this such that it would be accept that you would find it acceptable mm -hmm. I mean I'm hoping that you can find it acceptable give us right the yeah. ability to vote on it then and then yeah Monday would be great because they yeah. could move this stuff yeah I mean right you never the way things have happened possible? they're back that's next week yeah, so yeah. I mean I think it would be safe <sighs> if we pass a resolution of endorsing the affirmation of the state board policies as outlined here and the four specific recommendations on um, the smarter balanced uh, assessment, uh, the performance funding support, budget support for MDE, and the uh, staying strong, consistent with keeping our Michigan Merit curriculum. I make that motion that we, um, we affirm a statement uh, in support of those uh, policies and those four specific legislative items. We could pass it uh, now with uh, so approving our legislative committee to um, develop a detailed right. um, to communication okay. on Great. our behalf. Is the motion is there Second that. support supported by Kathleen? Any further discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Great resolution. Good, Good idea. Okay. okay. Thanks, Richard. It was the uh, car seat, seat. Car seat, seat metaphor. I'm going to work on that, that got tonight. us through. Yeah. Car seat See if I can get that in there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, but I think Richard's see. right that we all uh, we should give them the credit of, of agreeing with us that they want the best, what's best for the children. Yeah. Yeah. And not say that it's always a good not strap them in the car seat backwards, or they're <laughs> strapping our children in the car <laughs> the seat backwards. Of intentions. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Unwittingly, <laughs> thinking it's safer to go. Which was the right way? Facing forward or backward? <laughs> <laughs> um, consent uh, agenda. Yep. I move the consent agenda. Support by John. Supported by Cassandra. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Same. Or comments by state board members? Yeah, I had a couple things I was thinking. Please. So, first of all, I wanted to say that the legislative conference, the NASB legislative conference, was, was informative. And one of the things that I, that I heard, incidentally, was that uh, God, the Smarter Balance probably wouldn't be ready in 2014 and probably wouldn't be ready till 2015 at the earliest. Have you heard that? Joseph? The assessment. The assessment. Yes. Um, I have been able to watch the development of all the contracts that have been let now with Smarter Balance, and we are on track for, the, uh, for spring of 15, which is the intended date. Okay. Oh, so we, have, we can't say it's going to be in 2013 or 14 if it's going to be 15 yes. in the state and yes. So what, what's coming? Uh, so that was that was one thing. It was That was from the head of uh, CCSSNO who told me that. So I thought that was a pretty good source. And uh, let's see, we had some concerns, we've heard some concerns about the certification rules that are now at JCAR. And I don't know that we can do anything about them at this point, but uh, could we get some update from, is Carol still here? 
Yeah. Want an update on where they're at? Where they're at? What the what the timing is? At the process. Steps. Right. Well, Look they were just submitted to JCAR by the Office of Regulatory Reinvention yesterday, uh -huh. and so what that does is it starts the 15-day session just start rules. clock, which um, the legislature is not in session until next week, and if they meet like their schedule shows, then the 15 session days would be completed after their May 17th session. Oh, May and then 17th. after that, ORR submits those rules to um, the Office of Great Steel and the rules take effect. Oh, so if, if, if anybody has concerns about some of the specific rules, they should get in touch with JCAR? JCAR has um, authority to file an objection to the rules, um, and there's a whole process that they have to follow, including um, House and Senate passing legislation that would have to be enacted and signed by the governor to, in order to stop them. Keep in mind, this is after all the public comment yeah, and all right. the changes. This is after all the public comment and all of the changes made based on public comment. So now it should be, usually by the time it gets to this point, it's pretty smooth sailing. Yeah, but I, apparently there's some people who didn't know all the rules of the game and have some concerns. So, so, okay, so they have Always. until May 17th to say something, to do something about it. Always there will be. Okay. That's... That's all we can do, I think. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. Any other comments by board? Okay, May is our combined meeting. Uh, well, we have our regular meeting, but part of it will be with uh, the committees. That'll be interesting and informative, and I think helpful to mutual understanding, kind of with the last. Uh, and I assume it, the agenda planning, or somehow we should talk about how we make that a very fruitful discussion yeah. and how we want to what we want to get out of it. So think about that and what's the most effective is that just dialogue. With, is that just with the vote? That's with the House subcommittees on education, appropriations and education, or is it the House and Senate? For me, yeah. it's the two House subcommittees of appropriation. One is the school aid subcommittee, one is the it's department's the House budget. Committee. Senate is not involved. Right, just okay. the House. And it, did Covington confirm for June? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is the health program, health, the health uh, safety, that's the one in, that we've been talking that's about, in May. for schools, yeah. there's a pipeline at all? That's in May. It's going to be in May. Okay. We're good? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes, we're adjourned. Thank you. Super.